Well, I want to thank Axel and Chris for a, a really terrific introduction. And uh, I would be remiss if I did not thank Laura for helping with some very complicated logistics to get me here. Uh, I also want to thank Denise, I want to thank Jeff, and I definitely want to thank Kathy for everything that they did uh, to help get me here. What I would like to do tonight is I'd like to talk about some of the things that I wrote about in the book that, that Chris mentioned. And I want especially to put it in the framework of understanding the outbreak of the First World War as it relates to commemoration. And what I mean by that is that we have a, a literally once in a lifetime opportunity here with the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the war coming up, not just to uh, commemorate, but to educate, to explain, to try to explain to a younger generation, as Chris was talking about, what this was and why it's important. And it seems to me that the most important thing that we can do is make sure that the next four to five years we, as a community, are not simply reinforcing old stereotypes, and we are not um, just rehashing old stories, that we are trying to explain as best we can what the people of the First World War were going through, what they did, what it means, what it continues to mean. So what I would like to do is begin with um, a statement that I made when Sophie invited me up to talk at Penn State in a question and answer period. I used the phrase that one of the goals of this project, uh, of this book, was to get the people of 1914 out of this stupid box. And I want to show you what I meant by that. So if you think about the First World War, if American students especially, I think it's also true a little bit of British students, if you think of the First World War, it is likely something like this. This is a, a page from the calendar that my, my daughter, my wife and daughters bought me for Father's Day a couple of years ago. This is the Onion's desk calendar, Our Stupid Century. Um, and this is the one for June 28th. And the headline, of course, is War declared by all. Austria declares war on Serbia, declares war on Germany, declares war on France, declares war on Turkey, declares war on Russia, declares war on Bulgaria, declares war on Britain. Two more I love here. Um, Ottoman Empire almost declares war on itself. <laughs> and since we're so close to St. Patrick's Day, uh, area drunkard declares war on Ireland. <laughs> so the stereotype here, the, the stupid box that, that's being described here, of course, is a war that's being fought for no purpose, a war that never should have been fought because the people of 1914 were stupid enough to let something like this happen. If you don't like that one, maybe you like this one. Um, brilliant entertainment. Um, one of my uh, favorite things to show students, at least to kind of begin a class or, or get them, not my students now, but my undergraduates, to get them awake and moving. This is, of course, uh, Blackadder. This is the World War I era Blackadder. Um, I know some of my colleagues, especially some of my British academic colleagues, uh, love to rip this thing apart for all of the inaccuracies and all of the mistakes. I take all of that. It's still great television. Um, but the stereotype that's being played here is that this man, Edmund Blackadder, there in the middle with a pair of underpants on his head and two pencils up his nose, is the only sane one in what has become a completely insane world. And the reason you cheer for Blackadder is that even though he's a malingerer, even though he's by his own definition not a very good soldier, he is the only person who seems to understand just how insane the world is around him. If you don't like that one, if you want something a little more somber, you can go to Oh, What a Lovely War, which began in the East End of London in 1964, then became a very successful uh, movie as well. This is the actor playing Douglas Haig, uh, standing in front, of course, of rows and rows and rows of crosses, the symbolism being, of course, very important. Um, this film came out around the 50th anniversary of the First World War, and therefore it was very powerful and very important in shaping the way uh, that people began to think of the First World War in the 1960s as that generation of First World War veterans was, to use a very bad euphemism, moving off the stage. So whichever way you want to do this, I could have done many more. Um, if students know about the First World War, they know something like this. Uh, what we need to do, I think, one of the things that we need to do is bring these people of the generation of 1914 back to life. What we need to do is take them out of the stupid box. Um, and I know I've had undergraduates tell me that it's hard to understand the First World War because the pictures are in black and white. I think that might be the <laughs> dumbest reason I've ever heard. Um, this feels to them like a world so far away, in some way so much further away than a century. And, um, I sometimes think I'm trying to explain to students um, a war that's being fought for concepts that maybe they don't even have a they don't even have a memory of things like monarchy, right? Things that we don't even really think about now. Um, th this this war has those concepts in them. 
So what I used to do when I taught undergraduate um, survey history classes, 1500 to the present, I would end up, even when I was the one writing the syllabus, I would end up with maybe 10 minutes to explain the outbreak of the First World War, right? What I found was there's two ways to explain the outbreak of the First World War. There's the 10 minute version and there's the semester version. There's really nothing in between. So even though I didn't like it and even though I was uncomfortable with it, I did the 10 minute version. There's some, uh, I don't know, miasma of, of nationalist fervor somehow bubbling and somehow some guy that nobody really knows gets shot and somehow the whole thing blows up. So what do you do? You teach Morocco, you teach, uh, you teach the Franco-Prussian War, you teach the loss of Strasbourg. You teach these things that you know had been in place for years. Therefore, as historians, we get really uncomfortable, right? If the, if the French had been burning for Alsace-Lorraine since 1871, why does no war begin until 1914? And even then, it's not France that is the cause of it, the, the, the most direct cause of it. So you stand up in front of a room, much like this one, with a bunch of tired, sleepy undergraduates, and you're telling them things that you know aren't right. But you don't have a way to explain it any other way. So that's what kind of got me involved in this project when um, an editor from a different press than the one I ended up writing it with came to me wanting a new book about 1914. And I pushed back on the ideas this editor was pitching to me, uh, saying that I did not want to do another diplomatic history. And I didn't want to do a book about war planning either, because the first one, I think, doesn't really tell us anything we didn't know. And I don't really know anything about the second that I go and take a job at the Army War College. So what I wanted to do instead, what I wanted to do was take a look at, at this generation of 1914. What is it they were experiencing? What is it they were seeing? How were they interpreting the events around them? And then the second part of my research question, so what? What might that tell us about the world of 1914 and the world that came subsequently that might give us a slightly different picture? So it was not the intent of this project, it is not the intent of this lecture, to assign blame or to say that it was more Germany's fault or Russia's fault or whatever. Nor is it an attempt to um, say, well, if the Germans had just put another corps on the right wing, then the whole thing, uh, it's not my intent at all. So what I want to do is explain kind of, again, what the generation of 1914 was going through, how they were experiencing it, and why this view of 1914 uh, might tell us something a little bit different. So we start with this guy, right? The Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who supposedly is the cause of all of this, or if you believe, um, Blackadder, right? Uh, poor old Archie Duke and the ostrich died for nothing, right? Okay, <laughs> to a certain point, I get what Baldrick is trying to say there. Um, of course, if I have lots of time to talk to my students, if it's a class on the origins of the First World War, the first thing to do is to ask who this guy was and who cared that he got shot. And the answer to the second question is a surprisingly small number of people, right? Even inside the Austro-Hungarian Empire, for all kinds of reasons, my students tend not to care about the political stuff they love the story of him having married Sophie for love. They love that supposedly his last words were, Sophie, Sophie, do not die, live for our children. They love that stuff. That they eat up. Uh, but it's a way of getting them into who this guy is and why the assassination is, in fact, a fairly small, uneventful issue. It is, of course, the July crisis. It is not the June crisis. And there's a reason for that. So you get things like this. Stefan Zweig living in Vienna. Um, only a few weeks more and the name and figure of Franz Ferdinand would have disappeared for all time out of history. And of course, he's right. There had been political assassinations in Europe before. Um, I would actually argue this is the third most important assassination, the third most dramatic assassination that happens in Europe in the spring and summer of 1914. The assassination of Jean Jaurès, clearly more shocking and more frightening to most people than Franz Ferdinand, a name that has completely dropped outside of uh, France and history. And I would argue that the assassination or the shooting of Gaston Calmet, about whom I'll speak in just a minute, was infinitely more interesting and infinitely more shocking. Okay. It does not make sense to me to teach the shooting of this man as the way that all of this kind of comes apart. Um, the Irish Times reported just another tale of blood in the annals of the ill-fated Howells of Habsburg. Right? This had happened before. And when you follow the newspaper accounts out, as I did in doing this project, this is front page news for a day, it's second or third page news for a day, and then it's gone. It's just gone. And as some of you probably know the story, uh, the emperor refused to go to the funeral because this was not a royal marriage. Therefore, he didn't feel that he should go. Uh, a, a, a British journalist who was at the funeral said Franz Ferdinand was buried like a dog. Uh, the, the, ceremony, the, the, the ceremony had so little ceremony. That's a great way to phrase it, Mike. Um, but th this, is, this is something that most people in Europe are actually reading could actually be a positive development in Europe, even people inside the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So what happened? 
Oh, sorry. So what are they talking about? Well, of course, in England, they're talking about the suffragette movement, which is big news. Uh, they're also talking about um, in June or even early July, I would say, down to mid-July 1914, if a European refers to this coming war, the chances are excellent that they're not referring to anything in the Balkans. They are instead referring to the war that everybody expected to break out in Ireland at any minute. And what diplomats would say, what journalists would say, what, what observant Europeans would say is, yes, Ireland is ready to go aflame, but no great power will intervene because this is a British matter. In other words, this is going to be bad and nasty, but it doesn't affect France, it doesn't affect Germany, it doesn't affect Russia, so you can worry about it, but don't worry about it too much. The one they're really talking about, I love this, and students love hearing about this. How many of you guys know about the assassination of Gaston Calmet? Okay, for those of you that do, forgive a little bit of the story here. Um, this woman is Henriette Caillot. She is married to Joseph Caillot, a very well-known um, uh, French politician. Uh, Gaston Calmet is the editor of the French newspaper Le Figaro, still publishing uh, in France. Um, Gaston Calmet and Joseph Caillot despise one another. Uh, Gaston Calmet gets a hold of love letters written between Joseph and Henriette Caillot. Uh, the problem with these love letters, there are two. Uh, one of the problems is it reveals that they were um, having an affair while Joseph Caillot was still married, which, believe it or not, even in France, it's a, that's an issue. Um, and <laughs> these letters uh, have a lot of pet names and a lot of cutesy things that reveal a lot of inside information. And they seem to hint, also, some of these letters, um, that Joseph Caillot might have been a little sloppy with classified information that the Germans may have gotten a hold of. And Caillot already has a reputation as some guy that is kind of soft on Germany. So Henriette Caillot says to her husband, this man has offended the honor of our family. You need to challenge him to a duel. And Joseph Caillot, in effect, says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I think I'm going to be prime minister of France here pretty soon. I can't go killing newspapermen. Uh, Henriette Caillot uh, goes to a gun shop, buys a gun, goes into the basement, has the guy teach her how to load and fire it, walks into the office of Gaston Calmet, empties the gun into him, puts the gun down, waits for the police to arrive, and says, to put it in black adder terms, I shot him, I'm glad I shot him, I'd shoot him again. Um, open and shut case, right? Her lawyer comes up with a very interesting argument that in shooting him, she was taking on the male role in her family, and that her reason, sorry, her emotion overcame her reason. Therefore, because she was female acting in a male role, she cannot be held responsible for what she did. Okay? It is the first time in European jurisprudence, at least French jurisprudence, where the, it's the defense of, of not guilty by temporary insanity. Okay? And the trial was going on in June 1914. I ask you, which story is front page news? Right, right before uh, the outbreak of the First World War, the verdict comes back. Anybody want to guess? Not guilty. Okay. So, why weren't people worried? If this is such the dramatic event that we all know about, why weren't people worried? Well, here's one of the reasons. <coughs> I think people weren't too worried. <coughs> Europe had had diplomatic crises before. I want you to notice a couple of things about these diplomatic crises. One, I want you to notice the length of these diplomatic crises. Okay, the Fashoda crisis <coughs> from September 98 to March 99, the first Morocco crisis goes more than a year. These things go on for a very, very long time. The other thing I'd like you to note about all these big diplomatic crises, every single one of these is resolved peacefully. And you could make the argument, as many people did in 1914, several of these crises actually led to greater peace rather than greater instability. So the Fashoda crisis brings Britain and France, former rivals, together into an entente. And the Morocco crisis, at least the second Morocco crisis, leads the French president, Raymond Poincaré, to be the first president, French president to dine at the German embassy in Paris since 1871. Right? So the argument here is, what people are saying is, A, whatever crisis comes about because of the shooting of this archduke, it's going to be long and drawn out, so buckle your seatbelts. And maybe this will help, since neither France nor Germany is involved in this, maybe this can help patch up Franco-German relations the way the Fashoda crisis patched up Anglo-French relations. Maybe this can lead to an entente across the Rhine to match the one across the English Channel. The other thing that you see people talking about, and I don't want to be misunderstood here, I am not, I am not, I am not trying to revive the reputation of Kaiser Wilhelm. But the point I want to make is, in 1914, 
Kaiser Wilhelm is not this unstable warlord ready to set Europe alight, at least not until late July, early August. And I think the reason why this man, above all others, gets pilloried is that many Europeans felt that he had deceived them. In other words, he was preaching peace on the outside while planning for war secretly. So when you take a look at this, Kaiser Wilhelm is actually a finalist for the 1914 Nobel Peace Prize. Right? Kind of hard to, at least for me, kind of hard to put my head around. Look at the way he's dressed, right? <laughs> All right, there's the famous picture of him, right? He's got the helmet with the, the, the dove and then the helmet on the dove, or the eagle and then the dove, the helmet on the, on the, on the eagle. But you get people like Maurice Lowe, a, a, a guy that profiled him. I think it was for Harper's Magazine. Um, when, the period, when this history of the period of the German Empire is written, it may be discovered that his influence was for peace and not for war. Another phrase some, uh, one writer wrote about him said, this is a man of the barracks, not of the battlefield. In other words, he liked to wear uniforms, he liked to hang out with soldiers, but he was not going to start a war foolishly. And most people in Europe are much more comfortable with this guy than they are with his son, who is much closer with the German hypernationalists than is Kaiser Wilhelm. Um, Andrew Carnegie, one of the great pacifists pre-war, called him the, an apostle for peace. And most fascinatingly, when this war does break out, Edward House, um, um, Wilson's alter ego, identifies Kaiser Wilhelm as the one leader in Europe most likely to bring people to their senses. So again, I'm not trying to make this guy out to be anything that he wasn't. It is merely to say that Europeans did not see this guy as some hell-bent warlord ready to set the world on fire. Neither did they see his first cousin, Nicholas. They might have seen him as a little bit dim-witted, maybe not the sharpest guy in Europe, right? But what they saw in this guy was a man who had sponsored or helped to sponsor the two Hague Peace Conferences. The second one opened on his birthday in order to honor him, and a guy that the hardened realists in Europe thought had learned his lesson from the Russo-Japanese War. That you don't start wars unnecessarily, and that starting a war could very well lead to dramatic domestic consequences. All of which turns out to be true, of course. So what you have are a lot of people saying, well, look, these, these three emperors, including Franz Joseph, have been on their thrones for 122 years without starting a major war. It is inconsistent with their past behavior that they would start one over something as trivial as the death of a guy none of the three of them liked anyway. Now, of course, that's exactly what's going to happen. My point here is that that's not the way it's perceived in 1914. And I can talk about the socialists in question and answer if you would like. The socialists are very much viewed um, in the same vein as well. Alcest Lorraine, I wish Annette was here. I know Annette had to go back to Paris, but it's Annette's father that, that did much of the original research on this, um, the great French historian Jean-Jacques Becker. Um, this is what I was always taught, right? The French are burning for Alsace Lorraine, right? What you see, and again, it was Jean-Jacques Becker that did a lot of this initial research, and I picked up on some of his stuff and did some other work on top of it. It's really hard to find any evidence that this is actually motivating anybody. Not a single French politician in the July crisis of 1914, not one, uttered the words Alsace Lorraine or Strasbourg. Not one. Now, that could be a conspiracy of silence. Though, as my friends at the Army War College say, never attribute to conspiracy what can be better explained by stupidity. I don't think that's this either, right? You get things like David Starr Jordan, the president of, of Stanford, who in 1913 made a big tour through Europe and spent a lot of time in Alsace. And this is what he said. No considerable, considerable body of rational men in either France or Germany desires war or would look upon it otherwise as a dire calamity. And he said that in Strasbourg. And Jordan is talking about the ideas of many people in Alsace who want to create a European parliament and base it in Strasbourg as a neither French nor German city, or both. Right? My wife was a partly AFS exchange student in Strasbourg, so we have a lot of connections going on here. Uh, this postcard, Tushoff, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart um, to Alsace, I give, he gives finally our happiness. Once the war begins, Alsace-Lorraine is an issue. It is not an issue leading up to the July crisis. So, what's going on here? Well, I think one thing that's going on is that, and I, I apologize for all the text that's on these slides. When my army colleagues do this, I hate it. Um, but I wanted to, do, to make the point. What I've done on many of these slides is juxtapose things being said by people across borders, and sometimes being said across borders at almost the same time, uh, ju just to make a point. Uh, what you have is a confidence, some of it based on the economic arguments of Norman Angel that you're hearing again today, that two countries very tightly interconnected economically will not go to war with one another. 
Part of it is the belief that if you've had all of these other crises happen before, this one is unlikely to produce dramatic results. If Morocco didn't, if the Balkan Wars didn't, this one's unlikely to. Remember, it really only touches the interest of one great power, at least at first. So you get statements like Ford Maddox Fords, right? This one, when you show this to undergraduate audiences, they get a little freaked out when they see this one because they know that the history of the 20th century is going to show something a little bit different. But here's Ford Maddox Ford one year before the war breaks out. Um, I knew Germany as well as it was possible to know a country. I had lived there for long periods. Nothing in the world would ever make the German people go to war. Okay, I'll explain to you what, what does. Um, or this one from the French Socialist newspaper in May of 1914. Um, wherever one looks, one is aware of the international detente. For years, militarists have tried to force upon us the conviction that war is imminent. Uh, war has not started, and it appears that peace will not be disturbed. What I want to argue in this book, everybody takes the, uh, or, or several historians who have done this, take the two Moroccan crises and the Balkan Wars as indicators that things are getting worse in Europe. People in 1914 are arguing that things have never been better or had not been better in a very long time, um, symbolized by the wild, drunken party between the British and German navies at Kiel at the very moment that the Archduke is being assassinated. And I can talk a little more about that. OK, here's what I want you to take a look at, please. Here's this crisis in July of 1914. Notice how fast. Right? This is not a year. This is not eight months. This is one week. Okay, that's the first thing that I want you to note. This happens extremely quickly. The other thing that's going to happen is that every country that is going to go through this crisis can legitimately claim that their actions are based on self-defense. The only country you might be able to make that exception to, well, no, I'm going to hold that. I'm going to hold that. Austria-Hungary delivers this ultimatum in part because, and again, it's not my intention to assign guilt or blame in this lecture, they deliver that ultimatum in part because, for the first time in anybody's memory, Austria-Hungary is not the big bad bully of the Balkans. They are, in fact, the victim. This is the first time in a long time that they can do that. So that's number one. They have the backing of Germany, the famous blank check. They know that because Britain and France are not involved in this crisis, they're likely to move slowly. The odds are never going to be in their favor like this again. Okay. They're going to get some leeway because, after all, somebody probably sponsored by Serbia shot one of their royals. And neither the British nor the Russians really want regicide to become the way that reigns are decided. Okay. Well, maybe the French. Nobody else. Okay. So, so what you see here is how fast this is happening. Right? Austria can claim what it's doing is self-defense. It's avenging the murder of one of its royals. Sometimes, if you really want to break it down, yeah, it's a hard case to make sometimes, but they can do it. Serbia's response on July 26th is what really starts to scare a lot of people in senior decision making. It's not really until Serbia's response, maybe a couple of days before, that people really start to panic. Right? This is when they really start to think that a war is actually possible. This is when the armies start canceling leave. This is when generals who are on vacation are told to get back to their units. Okay. This is it. And again, it's why we call it the July crisis. Uh, July 27th, this is another thing you can do is you follow the, the letters and diaries in newspapers, which is uh, a lot of what I did. You'll read people's diaries, and in the morning, they'll say, hey, the morning papers came in. Everything's going to be fine. Then the evening papers come in. Looks like war and repeat the cycle again the next day. So you might get something like this. Russia, France, Italy, and Germany have all accepted arbitration in principle. What that means is Austria and Serbia will present their cases to the most disinterested government, meaning the government that has the least to gain. In this case, that's Great Britain. And whatever Great Britain decides, that's what they'll do. That's how the Balkan Wars ended. So on the 27th, the news looks good. On the 28th, the news looks bad. Austria has rejected Serbia's response to the ultimatum, and we're going to war. Um, there's also an idea that is floated around the 29th that you're not going to go to war because they're going to do something called the Belgrade Halt. What that means is that the Austro-Hungarian army is going to be allowed to occupy the Serbian capital while negotiations go on. That way, the war stays on the Danube River. It doesn't go anywhere else. Okay? And remember, the people in 1914 don't know anything about the Schlieffen Plan, Plan 17. Right? They don't know anything about that. Here's the big issue. 
30 July, Russia mobilizes. Okay. Again, this is not really what the book is about, but I think the current, the current um, um, consensus of scholarship is what the German government wants to do is put Russia in a corner. Okay. They issue a statement to the Russians asking the Russians to declare their intentions. If Russia does not declare war and steps down, Austria wins, Germany wins by extension. If Russia does mobilize, Germany can do everything it will now claim based on the argument of self-defense. Here's why the events of 1914 are so important later on. When you get to 1919, and the Allies put that Article 231 in the Versailles Treaty, the German argument will be, and not just from the far right, hey, the war begins when the Tsar mobilizes his Cossacks. What would you do? We may bear some responsibility. We certainly don't bear primary or sole responsibility for this. We mobilize because the Russians mobilized. And that was a sane and rational thing to do. So what you get are statements like this. The Manchester Guardian on July 27th, diplomacy will have all the time needed to localize this latest Balkan war where it belongs. Um, and the one that I, I really like, Edith Wharton's, just captures it. She was in Paris on July 31st. So this is you know, one day before all of this is going gonna, is gonna to happen. Um, she reports coming through the Guard de l'Est, noting a lot of activity, walking up to an officer and saying, hey, what's going on? Are we going to war? And the officer says, no, 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 madame. We're just, we're just getting some guys back from leave. No, no one's going to war over this on July 31st. And this is what she said. Of course there couldn't be war. The cabinets, like naughty children, were again dangling their feet over the edge. And then she says, but the whole incalculable weight of things as they were continued calmly and convincingly to assert itself. In other words, they're going to figure a way out of this. Exactly what I thought about sequestration, right? They're going to yell, they're going to scream, they're going to go to brinksmanship, but they can't let this happen, right? Well, they let it happen. Okay, so when it does look like it's going to happen, and again, this is, um, this is one of the times when I do want to um, uh, juxtapose a couple of things because they're being said on the exact same day. Here's a French soldier on the left-hand side. There is in our souls the clear certitude that France did not want this war, that she had hoped for peace until the last minute, and had worked for peace. Legitimate argument if you're French. If you're French, why are you in this war? The German army is mobilizing and moving through Belgium. That's a pretty good reason to go to war, right? The German army, or excuse me, the German uh, Tagebla, Berliner Tageblatt. Uh, one thing can be said of the German people with absolute certainty. We didn't want a war, and we have done everything in our power to prevent it. And the, the professor in me, the guy that grades a lot of undergraduate history papers in me, was fascinated to find how much passive voice there is, right? The sword is, shiv is thrust into my hand, right? We have been forced to make this decision, right? We didn't do it. The other guy forced us into it. So then you get these kinds of, of statements. Again, put right next to each other. The one I really like is Le Bonnet Rouge on the right, the French uh, syndicalist newspaper, uh, which once said that the French flag was only good for placing on top of a dung heap. When the war breaks out, they say this, France did not want this war. The government resolutely affirmed its specific intents. If by some calamity someone wishes to perpetrate this monstrous crime, all Frenchmen will know how to do their duty. In other words, we're not in support, and here's the socialist argument, we're not in support of an aggressive war to trade territories in Africa. But if someone's going to invade us, there's no question what we're going to do. This is the argument Jean Jaurès poses right before he's assassinated. Jaurès comes back from the socialist meeting in Brussels. He's furious. He can't believe the French government has been this stupid as to put them in this position. He goes to meet with the French cabinet, and right before he's assassinated, he says to his socialist brethren, if we were in their position, we wouldn't do anything different. And he guarantees President Poincaré that he'll have the full support of the Socialist Party. It's not, in my mind, that the socialists sold out in 1914. It is that their whole understanding of war has one gigantic footnote to it, which is that if a more tyrannical army is coming to shoot you, you have every right to self-defense. You're not just defending yourself, you are defending socialism. Okay, which is the argument Jaurès makes, it's the argument the German socialists make. Of course, they're making it uh, in contradistinction to the Tsar. Um, war is a bad dream, now it is a question of bare survival. It's a matter of our entire future, our national existence. Of course, he's thinking about the Russians coming into eastern Germany. Okay, so again, you all know the story here, but um, governments are very good at getting good control over information, controlling what appears in the press, um, controlling what people understand. 
and by controlling that message, they can, and the Germans are probably the best at this, reinforce that notion that everything we're doing is an act of self-defense. We don't want anything, we're only protecting and defending ourselves. And whether or not that is true is really irrelevant, as with all propaganda. Um, and the atrocity reports, which are, you know, I don't know about you guys, I was raised on, you know, hey, the Germans go into Belgium and they commit all these terrible atrocities, some may have happened, some may not have happened. The German press is reporting almost the exact atrocities, only they're Russian atrocities in East Prussia, which reinforces this notion of defense. And I want to come back to that in a little bit as well. How am I doing on time? I'm okay, right? Okay. Okay. Here's one of the things that I think is going on. It is really hard in 1914, pre-July crisis, to find statements like this. After the war breaks out, you find them everywhere. In other words, 1914 is not the product of nationalist hatred in Europe. It is, if anything, the cause of nationalist hatred. Here's the basic problem, and I'll come back to it in just a minute. There really are no strategic goals worth fighting for in 1914. There are no clearly articulated strategic goals as we would understand them. So what are they fighting for? They are fighting for defense, and they are fighting for, as Hugh Strong said, big ideas. So you get statements like this one. This is a British officer living in Ireland, his wife living in Ireland, who began a, a diary to explain to her newborn son the world that he was living in. So she starts with very basic events of the community, goes into the assassination of the Archduke, mentions it in one line, and then after Mons, and after all the stories of Belgium, this is what she writes. Right? She never mentioned a jury. She never said a mean word about anything up until this point. Then she says this, I have murder in my heart often. I wish I could tear a hun limb to limb for what they have done to children. If you get a chance, darling, do not spare one of the devils. Thank goodness you are a good shot. I hope God will curse their nation. Okay, and statements, of course, like Crown Prince Ruprex, annihilate the English, take revenge against England's hostile intrigues, and I love this part, for the many sacrifices we have to make. Again, putting it on the defensive. And events like Edith Cavell, who I was, was mentioned in one of the earlier uh, panels I was in today, things like the Lusitania, just increase that level of hatred. So what starts to happen, and again, this is a, an argument really more towards my First World War fellow scholars, um, it is not the so-called year of the big battles, 1916, that begins this, uh, this, this era of disillusion. It doesn't take people very long to figure out that the reasons they were told they're going to war are not the reasons they're actually going to war. If the Germans are going to war to defend against the Russians, why is seven-eighths of the German army moving west, not east? So you get statements like this one. I just love this one. This is Katie Kolwitz. This is a letter she writes to, I believe, her sister. Um, she writes this in September of 1914. She writes, one cannot hold on to any illusions anymore. Nothing is real but the frightfulness of the state, which we almost grow used to. In such times, it seems so stupid that the boys must go to war. The whole thing is so ghastly and insane. Occasionally comes the foolish thought, how can they take part in such madness? And her answer is, but they must, they must, because now, the only thing worse than losing this war, the only thing worse than winning this war would be losing this war. Right? Now what you're doing is fighting to keep that hatred that has built up from being brought down on you. And as you probably all know the story, she loses her son Peter just a few weeks later, and after the war produces this unbelievable sculpture that is aimed not at the dead soldier, but aimed at the parents who are grieving over that loss. Right? Now what you have to do, and I would argue it's in place by the fall of 1914, you have got to start to fill in this gap. What was this war for? Alsace-Lorraine will not justify the deaths of 1.5 million Frenchmen. It won't. And although it's not this project, in my view, fascism is the one political ideology that at least to some Europeans can start to fill in these blanks. Okay, and I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, this is a lot of text and I apologize. I put this on here to demonstrate a little bit that the soldiers understand what they're going through. They understand what is happening to them. They also understand they don't have a choice. And one of the most tragic things when I was doing a 1918 project was reading French uh, uh, letters back to their sons saying, hey, my generation is going to go through this so that your generation doesn't have to. And you think, okay, let's say that kid is 10 years old that kid's gonna go through it again, right? They didn't know it, 
but as an historian, of course, um, you know it. Um, let's see, you can already start to see as you look at these two statements here, the anger and hatred that is building up towards the governments that would allow something like this to happen. You can see some of that anger that's going to come, uh, uh, come out with such, um, um, such vitriol at the end of the war. Okay, so let me start to wrap this up a little bit and leave a couple of minutes to answer questions. Okay, so what do I think happened here? I think there really are four major arguments that I want to put out here. Uh, there are others in the book, but I want to start with these four. I, I, we have to get rid of this idea of war enthusiasm. We just have to. We just have to. Right? There is so little evidence for it. Right? You get a sense of determination. That is, there are plenty of young men who are saying, hey, look, if the Germans are going to invade France or the Russians are going to invade Germany, we have a right to defend ourselves, and that's what we will do. I came across virtually nothing from anybody saying, thank God I now have a chance to shoot a German. I've wanted to do it for 30 years, and my dad's wanted to do it for 30 years before. Thank God my chance has come. No one's talking that way. Second, the reason people fight this war, Len Smith, a colleague of mine at Oberlin College, um, Len talks about two consents. That is, the consent of society is to go to war, and then the consent to keep fighting. Okay, a lot of that consent is based upon the notion that what you're doing is defensive, and if you're fighting a defensive war, and this goes back to Christian war theory in St. Augustine, if your war is defensive, then your war is by definition moral. Third, oh, and by the way, by that second bullet, that's what makes making peace after this war so very hard. There's nothing strategic to fight over, a point I'll come back to in just a bit. Third, I may be pushing it with the language a little bit, but I think the general point is some one that I would definitely hold to. World War I is the cause, not the effect. Okay? In other words, those people in the summer of 1914 who were saying things are getting better, right? it's impossible to think of Europe the way it was a couple of years ago. Right? 1914 breaks all that. Okay. And then fourth, and again, this is a kind of specific World War I argument for my World War I colleagues. I don't think you need to wait for Verdun and the Somme to understand this process of dissolution. It's there very, very quickly. And remember, the casualty rates and death rates of 1914 are higher than they are in 1916. Okay. So you get statements like this one from Herbert Sulzbach, a Jewish German soldier. Um, 1914 was a year of pain and sorrow. This terrible war goes on and on. And whereas you thought at the start that it would be over in a few weeks, there is now no end in sight. Your feelings harden, you become increasingly indifferent. And right after he writes this, um, he writes about going to visit his sister on her birthday and seeing her sister's husband dressed up in his uniform ready for the front. And then a little while later in the diary, you find out what you knew you were going to find out, that he dies on the Western Front. So uh, this is a little bit more towards the people that I work with, but here's the problem. There are no strategic options. There's no way out of this by the end of 1914, and they know it. And the most famous example is Kitchener's. I don't know what is to be done. This isn't war. You're not fighting for anything. You're not fighting for anything strategic in the way that these guys would understand it. What you've done now, though, is created a level of hatred, or what the war has done, and created a level of intensity that makes it impossible for you to back down, which is part of the reason why, when the great powers are asked, to state their war aims, they can't do it. They can't do it. So the only option worse than fighting is to stop fighting. That's all that's left to do. Now you've got to win the war just so that you don't lose it, which is not basic military strategy. So why does this matter? Well, I'm going to give you three here. I think it's important because the meaning of what happened in 1914 becomes so hotly debated in 1918. And this is different as you go from country to country, of course. In the German case, it is an explanation of rejecting that notion of war guilt. In France, it becomes the idea of, of arguing that, that it is this great kind of rising of the French people at the Marne, another levee en masse that does it. Every country has its own kind of 1914 myth. Um, I forget which uh, French historian it is who uncovered this wonderful phrase from a French politician in 1920 who said 1914 is the last thing we'll ever agree on. In other words, we can agree on the need to go into the war, we can't agree on what it means to come out of it. Right? So when you get things like Never Again, this, this uh, drawing by Katie Kollwitz, who comes out of the war intensely pacifistic, the definition of Never Again is, of course, not shared equally by everybody. Second, the war as fought becomes separated from its political goals. This is the real danger area. 
This is, I think, why the war goes on as long as it does. The war becomes its own rationale for fighting the war. It's hard to identify those political goals. It's hard to figure out what it is you'll, how, how will you know that you have won other than the complete defeat of the other side. Okay. And then finally, I don't have to tell uh, you guys this, but 1914 sets up everything that comes later. To me, it is impossible to imagine the Russian Revolution, fascism, the Second World War, the Holocaust, without 1914 coming out the way that it came out and the way that the First World War came out. So if we're going to explain this war, if we're going to explain this event that we all believe deeply is the foundational event of the 20th century, it is important to recapture this moment of 1914 as it was lived and as it was experienced, not as the onion in Blackadder would have it. Only then can we explain not just the outbreak of the First World War, but why the young men of Europe were willing to do this in 1916. That, it seems to me, is our job as we move forward. Not to put these people back into a stupid box and say, well, clearly they were just idiots, but to explain what they were going through and explain why they reacted the way that they did. Thank you for your attention after a great barbecue. I'll be happy to answer any questions I can. Are there questions? Yes, and actually we'll need a mic. Andrea, are you here? Doran, would you mind grabbing the wireless mic? Joan, the light's in my face. Is that you with your hand Thank up? Thank you. All right. <laughs> Joan probably traveled the furthest to get here, so you should get the first question. All right, Joan, if you'll go ahead and, and state your question, I'll repeat it. Seeking some kind of settlement. I mean, the, I can see that France has no options once, yeah. once the Germans are that far into their territory. But why could not Germany have tried to find some compromise settlement yeah, at the I'm, end of 14. Germany is the, is the state I know least well. Um, but you know, German appetites grow with the eating. I mean, this is, this is another kind of, um, well, I'm, I'm getting this more from Dennis Showalter than from me. The, the German war is an operational war, by which Dennis means that the German army is aiming for what it can take, rather than containing its resources to what it wants. So there is the famous statement by Hindenburg, I think it's in 1917, when asked about war aims, he says, I need the Baltic states so I can maneuver my left wing in the next war. You know, that there, there isn't a concept, and, and one of the, I've argued this elsewhere, but one of the reasons I think Germany loses and the Allies win is that the Allies finally do get Clemenceau and Lloyd George, which how whatever tensions and whatever problems those two guys bring can create what the people that I work for would understand as a strategic as a security council, something that could identify war aims and identify a way forward, Germany never really does build that. Um, I think a lot of it goes back to the kind of stuff Isabel Hall is arguing with you know, the military making far too many political decisions. And I think Dennis has got something that, that Germany's war is an operational war, not a strategic one. So I hope that answers your question. Germany's, Germany's the one I'm least comfortable with. I mean, there is no answer. Yeah. Yeah, there, there actually are several points where Germany, I mean, I think after the Schmandedam offensive and after Passchendaele, when 1917, well, maybe not after Passchendaele because the Americans are coming by that point, but I mean, there are clearly opportunities, but before you get there, you have to say, what is it that I can accept as a victory? What is it that I'm willing to take? Yeah, but Germany was a dominant position. Right, if Germany's willing to evacuate Belgium, maybe keep the Eastern Front stuff, maybe Britain and France go for that, but Germany never seriously entertained it. Yes, ma'am. Hold on just a moment. Let me grab you a, a microphone. Thank you. Margaret, thank you. Um, I, I wondered if you'd comment or about um, the lack, what the strategic aims of Austria-Hungary were yeah. in trying to womp Serbia, because that always has seemed to me that They were in a situation where they had, you know, that it was war or neither, no solution seemed to make any sense. Yeah. Um, uh, and so it was womp Serbia, but. Uh, but to what effect? To, yeah, what, to what point? Uh, right, what was that going to yeah. actually solve? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, again, um, 
the Austrian state's even more opaque than the German in some ways, but uh, what, what they're hoping to do is solve that Balkan problem of theirs once and for all. That's the strategic aim, get Serbia off the map. More importantly to them, I mean, they really are looking at the pieces fitting together in a way that will never do so again. So what happens is you get Konrad von Hutzendorf, their chief of the general staff, who's been arguing for years for a preventative war against Serbia, a, a, a preemptive war against Serbia, and nobody will listen to him. Well, this gives him an argument now. This, this, this gives him something. And if Germany is willing, this is the great irony of the thing, right? If they think Germany is willing to guard the Russians, they think they're free to go south. Right? What they never do get clear, for reasons that are very interesting, is that seven-eighths of the German army is, in fact, going west, meaning that nobody's covering the Russians. So, again, it, it's, they're not thinking the way that you would normally, the, the way that you would see, hopefully, a 21st century modern military thinking. They're thinking about operations. And, one of the things in looking at this that so surprised me is really how little the statesmen understand about how their own militaries work. And it's very glib, but I described it to a War College audience once. They look at the military almost as tech support. Like, they don't quite know what they do, but they're going to call them and they're going to solve the problem. And it might be expensive, it might be expensive, but they're, they're going to solve the problem. They're, they're, they're going to find the problem and they're going to fix it. They don't have any idea how it actually works. And I've got a couple of these anecdotes in the, in the book, but the statesmen really have no idea how their own militaries are designed to operate. And that, to me, is, is, is really shocking. I am glad you are speaking a little bit of Austria-Hungary, because I was a little bit bothered in your book by the fact that you called uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand just one of the royalty. He was the heir to the throne. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it right, much sure. more important for Austria-Hungary. Especially it's, the age that Franz Joseph is. It's a very important yeah. And, and really, I don't know how you calculated your 125 years without war. Uh, Franz Joseph came to the throne with uh, Russian invading Hungary. So you, you have had a, a yeah. lot of wars between those countries. So that, those were the points that bothered me a little bit yeah. because nationalism was really the reason for World War I as far as the Austro-Hungarian Empire is concerned. And you just said so, but it didn't yeah. appear clear in what you had said the, before. The, the 122 number is not mine. It's, it's, a, it's a British journalist that uh, is really looking at, at multi-state wars rather than what, what, what they would have called in 1912 localized wars, 1914 localized wars. Um, I take your point, absolutely, and if that wasn't clear in the book, that's, I'll take the hit on that one, as the army says. I mean, it, the, you're not just shooting a random royal, you're shooting the heir to the throne, and you're shooting a guy um, who was proposing radical political change inside the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and all of that is really important. So if that didn't come through, I'll take the hit. Okay. Um, when Franz Joseph wrote the Kaiser and asked him if Russia came in, what was their what position, and the Kaiser did give the blank check, what are your thoughts there? It seems like the Kaiser could have said, you know, this is getting yeah. out of hand. Let's just stop. I, th I think, again, the Germans are doing very much the same kind of calculation that the Austrians are doing, that the, the, the dominoes are not going to line up this well ever again. And they're looking at a situation where France is, is obsessed by the Cayot trial, and this, this crisis does not affect France at all. So it, it's likely, if, if they're ever going to move slow, this is going to be it, as opposed to, say, Morocco, where they were keeping an eye on it because it did affect their interests. This doesn't affect British interests at all either. And as you know, the majority of the British cabinet until very late is opposed to intervention. And the German military calculus is 1917 is when Russia is going to hit their peak of modernization. So if you're going to go to war, this is not a bad, if you're going to do it, this is the circumstance in which to do it. And again, by putting the onus on the Russians, they get that opportunity. And um, um, uh, Bethlen Holweg is, is upfront about it. Holweg says, if I can, Bethlen says, if I can't depict this as the Russians being the aggressors, I will not have the German people with me. So when that Russian mobilization comes through, and the German socialists, there's that great statement the German socialists make, you know, where they, they support the war credits. In, in the book, you've got to read that entire statement to understand what they're doing. You can't just excerpt those two sentences. What they're saying is our government did a colossal stupidity in putting us into this position. And when the war is over, we're going to hold them to task for it. But the Cossacks are coming to Berlin. That's got to be our first priority. So I don't know if that quite answers your question, but I hope it does. Hi, Tammy. Hi, I have a question about the defensive war. Uh, this notion of all sides seeing it as defensive. How deep do you think that goes? So beyond the, the sort of politicians and the strategists, 
Yeah. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking about the cultural implications with the manifesto in, in October of 1914 from the German intellectuals. Right. Right. I mean, is this part of how you're conceiving of, of sort of the cultural defense of the war as well? Yeah, I think so. And I think it's part of that, you know, that, that second mobilization of, of support that Len talks about. Um, it's interesting. There are a few senior leaders, Moltke is one of them, who understands quite clearly what they're doing. I think Beth and Holig's another one, that we're breaking a lot of rules here and we're doing a lot of really bad things. And Moltke writes that famous letter to his wife where he says, you know, this has all gone bad and we're done, and then he has the nervous breakdown. Uh, I don't think the vast majority, I, I mean, I've found no evidence that the vast majority of people are thinking along those lines. Again, because they didn't understand what their own governments were doing. And um, yeah, I, I wanna, I'll leave it at that while the microphone's on, but I can follow up later if you want. I'd like to um, turn back to your chapter on the creation of hatred. How do you explain this triggering, how successful it was within the mass culture? Is there any prerequisites that might have been percolating over the years before that could turn this from a sensory war to a mythic war so quickly? Is there something that we should know about the mindset of the people at the time? You know, I, I did this just because I'm a nerd and because this is what I do for a living. But while I was writing this book, um, I started taking note of a newspaper article that an historian 100 years from now could point to, or uh, any, any item, that would prove that a war between the US and China was inevitable. It's surprisingly easy, right? You could go back and you could reconstruct a narrative that the US and China have been on a collision course for 100 years and they were economic rivals and, you know, bang, 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 that, that would almost guarantee that you, you could reconstruct that narrative really easily. I mean, what I would say is, I mean, yes, there are national rivalries in Europe. Um, a, that's not the only identity that people had. And B, they're, in my view, they're just not sufficient to cause a war. I mean, there's nobody, there's nobody in 1913, 1914, other than a couple of the elites that are making these big decisions. Hutz and Conrad's one of them. Really saying, God, we just, we've we got to fight a racial war against these guys. That's not what they're saying. What they're saying is, okay, those blankety-blank Germans or those blankety-blank Russians are up to it again once this begins. In other words, um, what you see a lot of people saying about the Germans is, hey, they put on this act that they were peaceful, but look how they really behave. Obviously, they've been lying to us all along. You get that, but it's only after the war begins. So I guess my point would be that, that the nationalism is a sufficient but not a necessary cause. Or necessary but not sufficient? Did I screw that up? It's, it's important to begin there, but it does not cause the war. Until I flunk philosophy. <laughs> Hi, uh, good evening, Professor. My name is Ian Kikuchi from the Imperial War Museum. Uh, I'm part of the team developing our new First World War Exhibition to open in 2014. Um, you joked earlier that there's the 10 minute version of the July crisis, or the, yep. the origins, and then there's the semester version. The, uh, the museum's current designs give us about 90 seconds, <laughs> so, uh, which is probably enough time to make one maybe two points. Yeah. I was just wondering what your one or two points would be for that. Uh, you know... <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, uh, Hugh Strawn from our academic advisory board is also scratching his head over this one as well. So. Yeah, well, Hugh and I have had this discussion. Um, I'd be <laughs> curious to hear what you say. I mean, you know, maybe I'm being overly influenced by my job right now working with senior U.S. Army leaders, but, I mean, really, it is the incredible inability of what we would call the national security system, that is, the senior politicians and senior military people, to understand what it was they were unleashing. And I don't just mean the short war syndrome. I mean the real inability of politicians to understand what their militaries did and the inability of the officers, the senior officers and general staffs, to put together military plans that could react to a variety of contingencies. They, they are war plans that are designed to win campaigns. They are not war plans, well, they are not war plans that are designed to achieve a variety of strategic ends. Um, if you only had 90 seconds, I think that might be the way that I would do it. Um, but God, I wouldn't want to do it in 90 seconds. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to talk to you about what Hugh told you because I'd be, I'd be, because Hugh and I have both sat there and said, how do you, yeah, there, I mean, yeah, I ended up in the, in the, in the intro to freshman history class that I, that I did at Southern Miss to, to undergraduates. I actually would say to them, look, nothing that I'm going to tell you is actually true, but you know, this is, or it's, it's half true. <laughs> but we're gonna do it so that I can set something else up and I'll, I'll, we're gonna break this bone and I'll set bits of it later. And that, that's hard to do to an 18 year old. I mean, they, I mean I, it's hard to do to me. Yeah. Wait, we, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Denzel Haney. I'm 
the administrator at the General Pershing Museum. Uh, in listening to you, I, I've not heard you mention the, uh, uh, the power of the industrialists who yeah. were pulling a lot of the strings before the war happened in attempting to get oil uh, from the Middle East. Uh, can you speak to that for a Yeah, moment? this is one of those where A plus, or one plus two really ought to equal three, right? So in other words, um, you have people who are going to make a lot of money out of this war, or could potentially. They are well connected in government. Therefore, it would be logical if they were pushing for war. And in fact, what you see from the industrialists is they're not pushing for war any more than anybody else is. That is, they're saying, hey, if those guys come after us, you've got everything that we can give you. And by the way, we love great contracts. Um, nobody is saying. Let's go to war because I can increase my bottom line. Maybe in the colonies, nobody's willing to do it in Europe. So it's one of those things where it, you know, one plus two really ought to equal three, but there's something about that leap. It's not happening. It's, it's not happening in Europe in 1914. And again, because that crisis is happening so fast, there's almost no opportunity for it to happen. That is, industrialists are perfectly willing to sell contracts to build dreadnoughts and build artillery and do whatever else. That crisis is happening way too fast for industrialists to say, hey, we ought to urge war so that we can get six weeks or eight weeks on our bottom line increased. And that's all they think it's going to be. So I just don't see that as a major factor. I was thinking more along the lines of the, the fact that, uh, Oh, sure. But remember, that's partly French-owned, too. So, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's more complex than that. Yeah, Mike, and I believe me, I've read enough books and enough things on the beginning of this war and everything else. And I've always had a secret sympathy somewhat for the Austrians regarding what happened in that thing. But tell me, what short of a war would have satisfied Austria in its relationship with Serbia? Yeah, I mean, that's another one. Like, again, I'm not a specialist on Austria, but um, the, you know, the, 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 the main Vienna newspapers are saying, look, we have to get our honor here, but we can do this short of a war, and we cannot go to war with Serbia unless we can prove that the Serbian government was behind Princip's assassination. So what happens is, once the ultimatum is delivered, everything changes even inside Austria. It, there is not a unanimous 100% call on Austria that we have to have a war with Serbia. There are plenty of people who are saying, look, we can put a financial indemnity on them, we can occupy Belgrade, we can adjust the border with the support of the great powers. There are other things that we can do. Um, could they have gone that way? Yes. Was the government in place at that time going to do that? No. And again, I think it's because of the way that those gears were interlocking. I mean, Conrad says it. We'll never get this, we'll never get the planets to line up like this again. If we're not going to go to war now, we're never going to war. Yeah. Thanks a lot for a really great talk. And I wondered if you could just uh, move geographically to the United States. Okay. And if these <clears throat> concepts try. of, of eagerness, of yeah. morality, of defensiveness, of disillusion, how are they playing out in the United States, watching this from afar yeah. over the course of you know, the fall of 1914? Yeah, I mean, Walter Hines Page, who is the American ambassador in Britain, when, um, when the war breaks out, you may know this, this he, he writes a letter to Woodrow Wilson explaining what he calls the Great Smash. And he has this great line. He says, um, uh, now and ever I thank heaven for the Atlantic Ocean. Thank God we're out of it. And then two years later, he's in Washington trying unsuccessfully to get Wilson's ear to tell him, we have no choice. We have to get involved in this war. And Wilson doesn't want to hear it. So there's an interesting kind of arc that's going on there. Um, I really think what's, well, I should be careful with this. Um, I would love to see someone do a book, dissertation, article, something, looking at whether the United States, what the United States was learning about the war in Europe. Um, I find it hard to believe that Americans didn't understand exactly what they were getting themselves into. Um, and I know, Chris, you've actually done some stuff on kind of American attitudes. Um, you know, <laughs> the reason I'm being so awful in answering this question, I think what you're seeing in the United States is a, is a series of different, there, there isn't one American response to this. There clearly isn't one American response to this. And I, I used to do this with undergrads, too. I used to tell them when I taught World War II, I said, don't get this in your head that World War II is the paradigmatic war, right? I mean, that's the one where there is no debate and disagreement for the most part. That's the weird one in American history. World War I is the one, I mean, I used to teach this by juxtaposing Roosevelt and Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, where Roosevelt is pushing for very different things than Wilson is pushing for. Um, I'm giving you a really bad answer. I think what is happening is a sense up to 1917, 
I see it less as enthusiasm, as saying, okay, this is something that is now in our strategic need to do. A world where Germany wins the war, potentially allied to Japan and Mexico, with all the nightmare scenarios you can imagine, Germany taking the British bases in the Caribbean, Germany taking parts of Canada, that is not a world that is in America's strategic interest. Which is why I think Wilson can go into that war and say, we're fighting to defeat Germany, but we're not necessarily fighting to help Britain and France. Which is that weird line that he walks. Oddly enough, it is Wilson who comes up with the most clearly identifiable strategic set of objectives of any leader. And he's the guy that knew less about strategy than anybody. So that's not a great answer to your question, but it's something I'm passionately interested in getting a better answer to. All right, we have time for one more question. I get an easier one, please. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Nyberg, is peace possible? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That That's was the one right. Laura asked me. Laura asked me that on camera. Talk about a question that does not have a 90 second answer. Sir. Yeah, hi, I uh, was just kind of curious. I haven't uh, had a chance to do as much background as you have, but don't you feel that the loss of the Moselle and the Alsatian coal fields had anything to do with World War I? I don't. Plus that the fact that the restoration of the Chateau of Hot Königsberg was the fourth largest expenditure in German history, yeah. and they taxed the Alsatians for that. I mean, that was just brutal. I mean, that was I mean, 1906. Look, I have no doubt that people were angry. I have no doubt that people were uh, um, bitter about that. I also can see no causal chain that leads to the outbreak of a war that the French people of all did not want. And again, that, you know, th th that, that was that thing again where I was looking at the thing with China, right? I mean, if you want to, you can pull out old issues of The Economist, not that old, a year or two ago, talking about, you know, battling for the undersea uh, oil and gas fields. And it's going to put, you know, I mean, were the French angry about it? Yes. What the, French are, what the French know, what their strategists know, and what serious Frenchmen know, is that you cannot conduct an offensive war for Alsace-Lorraine. Britain will not be with you, and Russia will not be with you. You're going to go up fighting against the Germans on terrain of their choosing, it, it won't work. You will lose. So, you, you, you know, you, what you find, and I, again, I wish Annette was here because maybe I could pick her brain about her dad's book, but, you know, w the loss of Alsace-Lorraine becomes, in the mind of the French right, a way to talk about how awful the French Republic is. But even the French right does not want a war to get back Alsace-Lorraine. And again, I'm going to do this very glibly, but, well, no, I'm not, because no, I'm, I'm going to skip this analogy, because I'm not sure I like it. But it, it becomes less a serious discussion of strategy than it does a way to say, look how awful the republic is. We ought to go back to something else. But n no, one, uh, no one in France by 1914 seriously advocates. And even when the war does break out, that's not, that's not part of the initial French rhetoric. Once the war starts, yes, getting back Alsace-Lorraine is going to be a French strategic aim. But it is not a serious aim of French strategy going into 1914. And Bob Doty's article on French war planning, I think, pretty well shows that. The, 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 the Plan 17, even though it goes towards Alsace and Lorraine, is not designed to reconquer Alsace Lorraine. It's designed to put the mass in the center so that Joff can figure out what the German army is doing and then counter it. The fact that it goes to Alsace Lorraine is, is almost coincidental. And I think Bob Doty's shown that beyond the shadow of a doubt. Thank you. Thanks.